Hello, uh, my name is Steve Thompson. Uh, I'm a lecturer here in the Department of History and Welsh History at Aberystwyth University. Uh, and I'm a historian of the modern period, offering a variety of different modules on 19th and 20th century British and American history. What I want to do in this lecture today is to give a, a just a brief uh, glimpse of an aspect of a model that I've taught in recent years. Now that model is a model on women's history in Britain from about the start of the 19th century through to the mid 20th century. And of course, as part, as part of that model, uh, we do consider that suffrage campaign uh, that took place from the 1860s through to the 1920s. And of course, as part of that, we do consider that suffragette militancy of the Edwardian period just before the First World War. What I want to do in this mini lecture then is just to consider that suffragette militancy and to pick up various issues uh, from that Edwardian period relating to militancy. Uh, but also that some of the ways in which historians have dealt with that issue uh, and have disagreed over it uh, in various kinds of ways. So, <clears throat> first of all, we're going to think about what exactly constitutes militancy. What did militancy mean in that Edwardian period and how have historians uh, dealt with it and, and responded to it in their work? Secondly, I'm going to look at the ways in which, some of the ways at least, in which milit militancy was portrayed and perceived. Uh, because if we are to truly understand what militancy meant, then we need to think of the ways of, of the ways in which it was portrayed and then perceived by people at that time. And then we'll just conclude quickly uh, with a brief consideration of the extent to which militancy was considered harmful to the movement. Uh, again, that was something that was considered at the time and something that historians have also picked up in their work. First of all, then, uh, the meaning of militancy. Well, I'm sure you're aware that militancy, the militancy of the suffragettes came in a variety of different forms. Uh, I've set out half a dozen of those different forms of militancy or acts of militancy uh, here on this slide. Uh, I'm sure many of you are aware of Emily Davison, uh, the suffragette who died as a result of her protest during the, uh, during the horse race in which she tried to uh, interfere with the king's horse. Uh, I'm sure you're very familiar with the kind of militant tactic of heckling. This was something that was used you know, repeatedly on numerous occasions by suffragettes. Uh, more usually in that Edwardian period, heckling uh, the speeches and public uh, talks um, of prominent liberal politicians, uh, quite, quite often members of the government. Uh, campaigns of window smashing took place. Uh, later on, uh, arson against empty properties. Uh, in 1911, uh, there was a boycott of the census, and we know, of course, that there were hunger strikes uh, by imprisoned suffragettes uh, who had been sentenced to imprisonment as a result of their other militant activities. Now, I quite often ask my students to try to rank these different forms of militancy according to their militancy. Uh, what exactly would you uh, say constituted the most militant of these suffragette uh, militant activities? Um, many people come to the conclusion that it was indeed arson, for example, because of the very extensive destruction of property. Some others come to the conclusion that it was hunger striking. Um, and historians have sort of noted the sort of symbolic significance of hunger striking then as a tactic. And it's, uh, you know, it's quite considerable militancy. Uh, because in the violence that was done to suffragettes' bodies uh, through this hunger striking, uh, what they were doing was um, revealing uh, the misogyny right at the heart of the British government at that time, and the lengths that it would go to to deny women the vote. Uh, so this was the most radical and perhaps the most militant uh, tactic used by suffragettes at that time, according to many. Uh, and it's quite hard to disagree with that. The Historians have uh, considered and thought about militancy, of course, and there are a few historians who have suggested different ways in which we might think about that militancy. So, for example, Martin Pugh, in his um, self-titled revisionist analysis of this uh, women's suffrage campaign, has pointed out that, yes, I mean, militancy focuses attention on their methods, but perhaps that is not the only way in which we should think about uh, the suffragettes. Because, you know, as he notes here, uh, those suffragettes quite often came from very privileged backgrounds, from the middle or indeed upper class. Uh, they were quite often part of that uh, kind of male elite world uh, that was indeed denying the vote uh, to women. Uh, that they were 
um, but they were not necessarily trying to bring about some sort of radical change in the British political system. Uh, they wanted women to be enfranchised, but only so that they could join that political uh, world in Britain at that time. Uh, so they weren't looking to tear down the system and create something completely new, of course. They merely wanted to be added to that system in order to play their particular role within it. Uh, so very much part, perhaps, of the uh, British establishment, the British political establishment at that time. So that, you know, all does the way in which we think about the suffragettes and their militancy, and is something, you know, to most definitely bear in mind. So that's one kind of perspective that perhaps we need to keep in mind when thinking about these kinds of things. Another perspective is offered by Sandra Stanley Holton uh, back in the 1980s, and she uh, questioned the meaning of that word militancy, uh, as you can see from this slide. So as she points out, very few of those suffragettes were willing, willing to use the most extreme forms of violence against property. Um, it was only a very small handful of them that were willing to go so far as um, arson on empty properties, for example, or other kinds of damage. Uh, and that was only from you know, the 1912 onwards in those last few years of militancy before uh, the outbreak of the First World War. So in that respect, quite a few, uh, the, the majority of suffragettes indeed, were not uh, that militant. On the other hand, if we consider militant uh, to be you know, a preparedness uh, to challenge the status quo, uh, to raise their voices against uh, the political system as it existed at that time, uh, to engage in that public uh, campaigning, then perhaps we need to conclude that it was both suffragettes and suffragists, the constitutional wing of the movements, uh, that were indeed militant at that time. Um, perhaps we should argue that uh, you know, the suffragettes, because of their various public activities, uh, as we can see here, uh, that this constitute, uh, constituted a radical and indeed militant uh, form of political activism at that time and according to the values of that time. So I'm sure that you're aware of this National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies, this Federation of Women's Suffragist Organisations, uh, established uh, in 1897. Uh, how by that Edwardian period, and certainly by the latter part of the Edwardian period, it was a very, very large organisation with a great many branches right across all the nations uh, of the United Kingdom, uh, with large numbers of members enrolled in those uh, societies. So on that level, this is you know, a very significant, large-scale female political organisation, which did, as I mentioned already, engage in these different public uh, demonstrations, these marches, these pilgrimages, uh, these demonstrations then, in a way that was you know, not necessarily considered in a very sympathetic way at that time. You know, the idea of women engaging in these public uh, kinds of activities or these activities in a public sphere was still rather... Um, controversial at that time. And of course they did conduct, uh, utilising you know, the constitutional methods, uh, they did conduct this very significant uh, propaganda political campaign at that time uh, through the publication of newspapers, magazines, of uh, pamphlets and articles and so on, in addition of course to the many petitions uh, that they presented to the government and to male politicians as well. So this kind of level of political activity uh, was, we might argue, uh, following Sandra Stanley Horton, uh, militant in the context of the time. Moving on to the second kind of theme then of this mini lecture, uh, the portrayal and then the perception of militancy. Uh, I think it's important to consider this because you know we need to understand how people at that time uh, understood or portrayed or perceived and understood uh, militancy uh, during the Edwardian period. So here, for example, is a series of anti-suffragette postcards uh, that were produced in large number during the Edwardian period um, and have become very, very collectible even by today. And as you can see then, this is a very unfavourable and flattering uh, portrayal of suffragette militancy uh, and of the suffragettes themselves that was clearly intended to undermine uh, and indeed uh, destroy that uh, campaign itself. As we can see here, uh, these postcards are most definitely playing upon uh, contemporary ideas about the appropriate roles for women. So this idea that women should be in the domestic sphere, taking care of their various domestic 
responsibilities, such as looking after the house, uh, rearing children and what have you, uh, was imperiled by these public activities in the field of politics uh, by these suffragettes. So very, very harmful to the home and by extension and to society as a whole. In addition, that uh, that illustration, that postcard uh, in the middle of the slide, at the bottom there, also hints at another very strong strain in these attacks on suffragettes at that time. That somehow politics, involvement of women in politics, um, destroyed their femininity. Uh, according to the language of the time, it unsexed these women, made them less like women and possibly more like men, uh, destroying their essential nature as women. Uh, again, this was a very, very uh, virulent strain within the anti-suffrage and anti-suffragette uh, movement at that time. Um, and again, you know, it's something that we we see right through the 20th century as well. This idea that feminists are somehow man-haters, uh, bitter, uh, shriveled up uh, old maids, as, as it's uh, portrayed there, um, who are intent on uh, pulling men down and destroying the world that they created. So in some ways, perhaps, uh, these are ways, this is clearly propaganda. This is an attempt then to undermine uh, that movement and to uh, attack militancy as a tactic. And perhaps it did influence some people's understandings and thinking about those things at the time. In contrast, the suffragettes themselves, in their own self-portrayals, um, understood their campaign and communicated that campaign in very, very different ways. Um, so here, for example, we can see certain um, publications in that campaign portraying uh, suffragettes in a very, very different way. So on the left, for example, we can see um, those suffragettes who have been prosecuted, who have been imprisoned, uh, portrayed as somehow as prisoners of war. Uh, and this was a very, very important part of their uh, campaign at that time, uh, this idea that you know, those suffragettes in prison for their militancy were political prisoners uh, rather than common criminals, therefore should be treated differently. But I think what's also interesting about that particular portrayal is this uh, use of a uh, kind of medieval trope. Um, I don't know if the kind of intention here is to draw upon ideas of Joan of Arc, for example, but what we do see is that kind of medieval militarism, uh, this idea of uh, knights on horseback, uh, is a very common theme then in these uh, uh, visual portrayals of suffragette militancy uh, by themselves at that time. It's a much stronger image, isn't it? Uh, it's a much more heroic image. Um, very, very clearly, very, very different to those anti-suffragette postcards we saw just a second ago. On the right, we see Emily uh, Davidson, uh, the suffragette who was killed uh, by her protest then in that horse race that I mentioned earlier. Uh, being portrayed there at that race course as a martyr for the cause. And every political cause, of course, needs a martyr uh, to rally support, to raise the profile, um, to offer some sort of example of self-sacrifice then, the greater good of the cause. So again, you know, we can see another uh, very different self-portrayal of militancy from the suffragettes themselves. Um, you know, much more inspirational, uh, far more dramatic, uh, far more heroic. Uh, I think it does demonstrate uh, the, the considerable talent of the suffragettes then for uh, for propaganda, uh, for public uh, self public uh, publicising of their activities. Uh, very very gifted uh, communicators there within the Women's Social and Political Union. A few other posters then, uh, produced by the Women's Social and Political Union, uh, again, kind of uh, suggesting uh, these ideas of martyrdom then uh, on the part of suffragettes for the good of women and for the cause itself. So there on the left, of course, you see that um, force feeding of suffragette prisoners, uh, those suffragettes who had gone on hunger strike whilst in prison, uh, insisting that they be treated as political prisoners rather than common criminals, uh, refusing to eat in protest at that uh, failure to classify them as such, uh, then being force fed by the prison authorities. And again, you know, the suffragettes made a great deal of play 
out of this kind of treatment there, uh, utilize it to a very significant degree uh, in their uh, campaigning methods, as we can see here. And then, of course, sort of related to that, this very famous poster uh, referencing the so-called Cat and Mouse Act, uh, that piece of legislation that allowed prison authorities uh, to release suffragette on hunger strike when her health became uh, quite bad, uh, to allow her out uh, back home, uh, to then start eating again, uh, to start recovering, and then to rearrest her when she was in uh, a sufficiently strong state once again. Uh, very much like a cat playing with a mouse, toying with a mouse, uh, releasing and catching, releasing and catching, and so on. This again, you know, shows again some sort of uh, talent, some sort of genius, perhaps, uh, for propaganda on the part of the Women's Social Political Union in order to utilise uh, this government action against uh, their hunger strikers in this particular way. Uh, very, very striking uh, poster once again. And again, utilising that kind of theme of martyrdom in the, in the cause of women's suffrage. So again, a much more positive, uh, much more powerful uh, self-portrayal of militancy than can be seen in the uh, propaganda of the anti-suffrage cause. We can see the ways in which some historians have picked up on militancy and have interpreted it in very, very different ways. So here's George Dangerfield, for example, uh, writing a very famous study of English history back in the 1930s, uh, very, very dismissive then of the suffragettes and their apparently irrational, hysterical kind of approach to this particular cause. Uh, it's possible to see certain male historians of the 1970s writing in a very, very similar vein, a very, very uh, damning kind of portrayal of militancy. Then again, we can consider the work of some feminist historians, such as Susan Kingsley Kent, who offer a far more positive uh, impression of militancy and its impact then on the campaign as a whole. Uh, we can see the extent to which it does give a boost to the campaign, according to these historians. Uh, we can see the extent to which you know, more and more women are motivated uh, to join, uh, whether that be within suffragist rather than suffragette organisations, but nevertheless joining that campaign and being mobilised then to do something about it. So portrayals and then perceptions of militancy differed, uh, varied in the Edwardian period and have varied ever since in the work of different historians. To some degree, this idea of militancy being harmful to the movement was, as we can see from this punch cartoon from 1906, evident in the Edwardian period. Uh, some sort of suggestion on the part of at least some people uh, that it was building opposition to uh, in the enfranchisement of women and therefore harmful. So it was evident there in the Edwardian period and it has worked its way into the uh, studies of different historians as well. So this is a, an issue to give forward to, to give consideration to, and perhaps for you to come to your own conclusions on this. Uh, having studied primary sources, having studied their secondary works, and uh, coming to some sort of conclusion on this. Whatever conclusion you do come to, we know, don't we, uh, that partial enfranchisement of women came in 1918, and that process of enfranchisement uh, was completed finally 10 years later in 1928. From 1928 onwards, all women over the age of 21 uh, were enfranchised on exactly the same basis as men over the age of 21 as well. Okay, well, thank you very much for listening. Uh, I hope this gives some sort of taste of the types of things that I do on my particular modules and we uh, in the department do in terms of the history that we teach. Uh, okay. Goodbye.